for her man. Mark teaches the complexities of American history regarding race, culture, and faith in order to help forge a path of healing and conciliation for the nation. He partners with numerous organizations to assist them in respectfully approaching, including, and working with Native communities. In 2012, Mark hosted a public reading at the U.S. Capitol of the Buried, of the Buried Apology to Native Peoples in the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Bill given by the 111th Congress. He serves as a Washington, D.C. correspondent and regular columnist for the Native News Out Online and the co-author of the book, Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. And he authors the blog Reflections from the Hogan. Mark also serves on the board of the Christian Community Development Association, or CCDA, and consults with the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, or CICW. He is a founding partner of a national conference for Native students called Would Jesus Eat Five Fry Bread? Mark is also the founder and director of Five Small Loaves, an organization that pursues racial conciliation through honest education, intentional conversation, and meaningful action. Under this organization, Mark has proposed the development of a truth commission to shed light into the injustices per perpetrated against Native Americans. Mark was also an independent candidate for the presidency of the United States, advocating for a truth and conciliation commission a formal and national dialogue on issues of race, gender, and class. Please join me in welcoming Mark Charles. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, please allow me to introduce myself more traditionally. So, yat e, Mark Charles Yinishia, Tsin Bake Dene Nishle, Do Tohiglini Bashishchin, Tsin Bake Dene Dasha Chaylor Toto Chitni Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage and that's why I say Tsin Bake Dene'e. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bake Dene'e. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans where Navajo people. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you tonight from what's now known as Washington, D.C., but these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. The Piscataway are the nation that they've lived here, they've hunted here, they farmed here, they fished here, they've raised their families here and buried their dead here long before Columbus got lost at sea and they are still here. I've had the, the honor of meeting some of the Piscataway. I've been welcomed to these lands by the Piscataway and I am humbled to be living on these lands today. And so I want to honor the Piscataway and thank them for their stewardship of these lands. I also want to acknowledge that the land where Westchester University sits is on the lands of, of the Lenape. And I want to thank the Lenape for their stewardship of the land where your university is, is situated. And had I been there in person, I would be honored to be on their land and to be speaking from them. But I want to make sure I acknowledge them, even though I'm only speaking remotely tonight. Um, over the next hour and a half, I'm going to be talking about some of our nation's history, primarily around what's known as the doctrine of discovery. I'm going to be laying out some history that many of you probably have not heard before and talking about some things in some details that may actually surprise you. Um, at different points during the speech, you may feel tempted to just turn off the screen or throw something at it or uh, just check out all together, but I encourage you to stay connected, stay engaged. Um, we're going to get to a better place, but we have to be able to talk honestly about some parts of our history before we can figure out what we need to do to fix them. And so I'm going to um, be also presenting as uh, along with my lecture, um, a PowerPoint so that you can see several of the dates and the quotes and the, the things that I'm talking about. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll continue talking um, from the background, but give me just a moment while I bring up my, my uh, PowerPoint and then share that for you to see. Okay. 
Okay. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I am not the first person, nor will I be the last person to talk about the doctrine of discovery. We have a, a lot of people, especially within Native America and Indian country, who have been working to bring the history of the doctrine of discovery to the forefront for decades, even longer than that. There is an author I deeply respect. His name is Stephen Newcomb. He's from the Shawnee um, and Lenape tribes, and uh, he wrote a book called Pagans in the Promised Land. I highly recommend this book. Steve and I don't agree on everything, but um, he has a very good analysis of the Doctrine of Discovery and I highly encourage people to read his book. I recommend it almost everywhere I go. There's also another uh, woman, I had the chance to listen to her today. I attended um, earlier today a, um, uh, a healing circle for uh, Native Americans who are descendants of boarding school survivors and boarding school survivors themselves. And there was a woman who was speaking there who I had the privilege of meeting on the campaign trail. Her name is Marcella Labue. She is a 101 year old World War II Army veteran. And she is also a boarding school survivor. And uh, she is doing some tremendous work even at the age of 101 to bring this history to the forefront and to engage at a national level on these issues. I met her at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum that I attended in August of 2019. And she was there asking questions of the candidates um, about our nation's history, um, including the doctrine of discovery. And I have so much respect for Marcella. I thank her for her tenacity. And uh, if you ever have a chance to meet her or listen to her, I highly recommend taking the chance to get to know her a little bit. In his final State of the Union, President Obama was, in a sense, lamenting some of the divisiveness that he encountered as our nation's first Black president. And in his final State of the Union, he was talking about the divisiveness that, divisiveness that he had seen, and he was talking about the need in our nation to have a new politics. And in that speech, he said, he quoted the Constitution, he said, we the people, our constitution begins with these three simple words, words that we've come to recognize mean all the people. Now that sounds beautiful. And he got a lot of applause for that line. But when I heard him speaking, I was sitting in my home listening to it on the television. And I asked myself, when? When did we make this decision? I wanna share with you some of the history that our nation has, that we're standing on as a country, that actually at a very foundational level demonstrates that not only did we the people not mean we the people back when our constitution was written, but even today in 2020, we the people does not mean all the people. And so to understand this, we have to start with a document known as the Doctrine of Discovery. It says, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. This is a papal bull written by Pope Nicholas V um, in 1452. This papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493, are collectively known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. This is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and their land is yours for the taking. So this is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent and enslave the people because they didn't believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions of people, and yet he claimed to have discovered it. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands, you can conquer them, you can colonize them, you cannot discover them unless you believe that the people who live there are not fully human. So this makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically white supremacist doctrine that comes out of a church that has put itself alongside with empire. Now the challenge with this doctrine of discovery is that it becomes embedded in the foundations of our nation. 
So in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains. And he essentially says to the 13 colonies here in the New World that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonists because they wanted access to those lands. So a few years later, they wrote a letter of protest. In their letter, they accused the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. They went on to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages, making it very clear the only reason the founding fathers used that inclusive term all men is because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. This makes our Declaration of Independence a systemically white supremacist document that assumes the dehumanization of people of color in general and native people specifically. A few years later, our founding fathers wrote another document. They started this one with the words, we the people of the United States. This of course is the, con the preamble to the constitution. This sounds inclusive. However, if you keep reading just a few lines later, not much further down to article one, section two, this is the section of the constitution that determines who is and who is not covered by this document, who is and who is not a part of this union. The first thing we need to note is that this section never mentions women. Now that's important because if you read the entire document from the preamble down to the 27th amendment, you will find that there are 51 gender specific male pronouns, 51 he, him, and his, who can run for office, who can hold office, even who's protected by the constitution. There's not a single female pronoun in the entire document. So we have to, acknowledge that Article 1, Section 2, first of all, never mentions women. Second, it specifically excludes natives. And third, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. So who's left? Well, in 1787, that literally left white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. See, we don't stop and think about this frequently enough. The reason we have a constitution, the purpose it was written, was to protect the interests of white landowning men. So today we act surprised that women earn 60 to 70 cents to the dollar. Well, this isn't surprising. The constitution's working. We get upset that our prisons are filled with people of color. This isn't surprising. The constitution's working. People act outraged that in 2010, the Supreme Court sides with Citizens United and rules that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. This is the ruling that opens the door for super PACs, gives them unlimited support for candidates. This isn't surprising. The constitution is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's protecting the interests of white landowning men. Now, some people may think, well, we've corrected that. Well, we've tried. Most people think that we corrected this with the 13th Amendment. They believe the 13th Amendment says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. However, that's not what the 13th Amendment says. What it actually says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party sh has, shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. See, we've actually never abolished slavery. We've simply redefined and codified it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. We've made slavery legal in prison. So it should surprise no one that we incarcerate our citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world. For every 100,000 citizens, we incarcerate 693 of them. That's 110 higher than the next nation, which is Kirkmenistan and about three to five times higher than other nations. This is comparing us on this chart to NATO nations, where we're almost three to five times higher than all of these nations that we share alliances with in NATO. And when we break these numbers out by race, it's even worse. Latinos and Hispanics, we incarcerate a rate of 831 per 100,000. American Indians, rate of 895. African Americans at a rate of 2,306 per 100,000 white people are incarcerated at a much more palatable rate of 450. 
So we have to acknowledge we've never abolished slavery. We've kept it legal and constitutionally protected within our criminal justice system. And to this day, we use incarceration as a completely legal way to keep people enslaved and remove their civil rights. A few years later, we passed the 14th Amendment. This actually was a direct response to Article I, Section 2. In this amendment, it extends the rights of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the government. This sounds great. However, if you keep reading, just down to section two, you'll find this amendment still specifically excludes natives, specifically excludes women, and it still keeps the criminal justice system as the gatekeeper for civil rights. So while this amendment extends some rights of citizenship temporarily to some former male enslaved people, it still leaves marginalized and disenfranchised huge segments of the, of the population. And we can't forget that after this amendment, we still had Jim Crow laws. We still had Indian massacres. We still had boarding schools. We still had internment camps. We still had segregation. We still had mass incarceration. We still have families being ripped apart at our borders. And we can't forget that in 1970, this was the amendment used in Roe versus Wade, which now concluded unborn babies weren't human enough to be protected by the constitution. So therefore they could be aborted. What this demonstrates is that our constitution does not have a value for life. And the assumption is actually one of dehumanization. What this means is that our constitution is a systemically racist and sexist document that assumes the white landowning male has the authority to decide who is and who is not human. Now, a few years later, we had uh, a Supreme Court case. It was Johnson versus McIntosh. This is two men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from the government. The other one got the same land they claimed from the a native tribe. They want to know who owned it, who had the right to sell the land, the tribe or the government. The, the, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this is the Johnson, or this is the John Marshall Court, and he had to decide the principle upon which land titles were based. They ruled the principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subject and by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, and that title was consummated by possession. They then go on to reference by name the doctrine of discovery and use that to determine that even though natives were here first, but because we were savages, we only had the right of occupancy to the land and Europeans had the right of discovery to the land. So therefore they were the two title holders. This case, along with a few others between 1823 and 1830, create the legal precedent for land titles. And that precedent and the doctrine of discovery get referenced by name by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. I want to talk for a moment about this 2005 case. When this nation was founded in the 1780s, the Oneida Indian nation occupied about 6 million acres of land in central state New York. The George Washington administration reduced that land down to a few hundred thousand acres via a treaty. And then they passed a law stating that only the federal government could buy or sell lands from native nations. And that those lands were specifically set aside for the United Indian nation. While the state of New York continued to illegally purchase lands from the United Indian nation until all the lands were purchased, the Oneidas were moved out and white settlement had moved in. In the 1990s, the Oneida Indian Nation came back from Oklahoma and on the open market, they purchased some of their traditional lands. They paid full price for them. And they wanted to reestablish some of their traditional sovereignty over those lands. Now, the city of Sherrill, where the lands that they purchased were in, within the city limits of Sherrill, they wanted the tax revenue from that land, which the United were not paying because they were establishing their sovereignty over them. And so they sued the United Indian Nation in federal district court. Um, the court actually ruled in favor of the United Indian Nation 
And so the city of Cheryl appealed to the court of the federal court of appeals, and that original decision was upheld. So then they appealed a second time to the United States Supreme Court, and the case was heard in, in the early 2000s. In the opinion written by the, by the Supreme Court in 2005, in the first footnote of the case, where they're establishing precedent, they reference by name the doctrine of discovery. They go on to reverse the opinion of the lower courts, and they argue that given the longstanding, distinctly non-Indian character of the area and its inhabitants, the regulatory authority constantly exercised by the New York State, and the United's long delay in seeking judicial relief, that they rule that the tribe cannot unilaterally revive its ancient sovereignty. They reference another case that says it is impossible to rescind the session and restore the Indians to their former rights because the lands have been open to settlement and large portions of them are now in possession of innumerable innocent purchasers. Now, in 1823, when John Marshall was, was um, writing his opinion in the original case, Johnson versus McIntosh, in building his argument, he argued that natives were savages. He said, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forests. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. In 2005, the Supreme Court uses that same argument. And they say, moreover, the properties here involved have greatly increased in value since the Oneidas sold them 200 years ago. It was not until lately that the Oneidas sought to regain ancient sovereignty over land converted from wilderness to become parts of city like Cheryl. They're making the same argument, just not using the word savages. So in 2005, they conclude that based on standards of federal Indian law, again, Article 1, or footnote one, the doctrine of discovery and federal equity practice, we preclude the tribe from rekindling embers of sovereignty that long ago grew cold. This is quite possibly one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime. And it was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. How? Isn't she, was not she the, the, the loud voice of dissent on an increasingly conservative Supreme Court? Wasn't she the justice who was fighting for the rights of the marginalized and the oppressed throughout her entire career? Didn't we see her legacy grow and build in front of our very eyes during the last five or six years of her life? We absolutely did. But because land titles are based on a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery and the legal understanding that natives are savages, what this does is this makes white supremacy a bipartisan value. And when push comes to shove, even the most progressive liberal judges will reference the doctrine of discovery because it's what holds up land titles. So this makes the United States Supreme Court a systemically white supremacist court that to this day has legal precedent based on the dehumanization of people of color. Now, in, initially, the Protestant church pushed back against the doctrine of discovery. This was a Catholic doctrine, and they didn't fully buy into it. In 1630, John Winthrop, who was a Protestant preacher, he was on board a ship, and he was in what's now known as the Boston Harbor. He was with a group of colonists. They were actually here to plant the Boston colony. And on that ship, he preached a sermon titled A Model of Christian Charity. In his sermon, he referred to the colonists he was with as a city upon a hill. He's borrowing from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he said to his followers that they should be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining their good deeds into this dark world. John Winthrop goes on to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. These are your basic Protestant church-going exhortations. At the end of his sermon, he's trying to encourage his congregants to heed his exhortations, and he quotes from the Old Testament of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. 
Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is the passage in the Old Testament where God, the, the God of the Israelites, is, is reminding the people through Joshua and Moses of their land covenant, which said if they obey God, he will bless them in their land. And if they disobey God, he will, he will remove them from their lands. And it says, but if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop changed that word to vast sea. Why would he do that? Well, they didn't cross a river, they crossed an ocean. So what he's saying is that based on the teachings of Jesus to be a city on a hill, and based on the land covenant of the Old Testament of Israel, they are now standing on their promised land, ready to go and take possession of them. Now, if you've read the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua, you will see how troubling this is. Because the way that that the God of Israel commands the Israelites to take possession of their promised land is to kill everybody. It literally says to leave no man, no woman, no child, no animal left alive. Promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another group of people. I refer to that sermon as the birth of American exceptionalism. That's in the 1630s. That idea percolates for about 100 years. Mid-1700s, our nation, the United States of America, our, the, the colonies begin expanding westward. They go past the Appalachian Mountains. They go past the Mississippi River. End of the, of the 1700s, there's the Second Great Awakening. There's a growth in churches. There's a renewal within denominations. There's now this religious fervor as the nation is moving further and further west. Early 1800s, the term manifest destiny is coined. The belief that this white European nation had God-given right to rule these lands, we know as Turtle Island, as Native peoples, to rule them from sea to shining sea. Now, maybe you're thinking, Mr. Charles, that's a bit stretching it. We don't think that way anymore. We don't refer to these as promised lands. That's not the mentality of our nation anymore. Well, I want you to think back to 2015. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, was here in the United States. He was actually lobbying against the nuclear deal that the Obama administration was negotiating with Iran. This is the same deal that President Trump negated when he got into office. So Prime Minister Netanyahu was lobbying against that. He was actually invited against protocol by the, the Republican leadership of the Congress to speak to a joint session of Congress. Now that Congress, just like Congress today, was deeply, deeply divided. Many members weren't even talking to each other. They could agree on nothing. And Prime Minister Netanyahu had to get everyone on the same page in order to, to make his speech. And so early in his speech, he hit on one of the most unifying themes in U.S. politics, which is the theme of American exceptionalism. And he said to our Congress, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. See, one of the reasons our nation, at its leadership in our Congress, has a bipartisan and overwhelming support for the nation state of Israel is because we have a very dysfunctional codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel. Has very little to do with freedom or justice or equality. We need Israel's Old Testament legacy of promised lands to justify what we did to African Americans and to Native Americans. And the modern nation state of Israel needs our country's flourishing as a nation with a manifest destiny to justify what they're doing currently to Bedouins and Palestinians. The relationship between the modern nation state of Israel and the United States is deeply dysfunctional, incredibly codependent, and has nothing to do with justice or equality or freedom. It's about justifying oppression, and in our case, even genocide. So now that we have a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery, 
a white supremacist Declaration of Independence, a racist, sexist, and white supremacist Constitution, a white supremacist Supreme Court, and God's permission to commit genocide. Now we have to talk about some history. I want you to think about the 18th or the 19th century. This is the century that we refer to in our history books as our century of expansion. It's during this century we add about 30 new states to the Union. I made this chart several years ago. This is 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue was a year I found our nation was in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year that I found we were fighting against native nations or native tribes. These are our list of wars I found we fought primarily during the 19th century against native nations. Clearly this was not a century of expansion. Look at from 1811 to 1886, we had almost 75 straight years of warfare against native nations. No, this was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It was during this century that we passed the Indian Removal Act. This is the act of Congress that in practice gave the US military the rights to remove tribes from their lands in the East to more empty lands further in the West. This resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Long Walk for the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache. All told about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation because of this act and tens of thousands of people died as a direct result of this act. In 1862, we had the largest mass execution in the history of the United States government with the hanging of the Dakota 38 the day after Christmas, 1862. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre, about 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children slaughtered by a US Army that was led by a Methodist pastor. In 1879, we had the start of Indian boarding schools. The purpose of these schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. Native children were taken from their homes, put into military style boarding schools, punished, whipped, beaten, abused for speaking their language, for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse that I've heard from boarding school survivors, mental, physical, sexual, even today at the boarding school healing um, seminar or, um, conference that I attended this afternoon, the stories you hear are gut-wrenching. And the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. In 1890, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee. This is a bit more um, familiar massacre. We teach this a bit more in our history books, but we don't talk about what really happened there. In the 1890s, the US Army met the Dakota people at Wounded Knee. They were there to negotiate the surrender of one of the Dakota chiefs. Neither side trusted each other and there were a lot of weapons present. No one knows exactly what happened first, but someone fired a shot and chaos just ensued. The US Army had three Hotchkiss cannons at this, at Wounded Knee. These are large cannons. They are, they shoot multiple rounds a minute. They're accurate up to a few hundred yards and they're raining down shells on the Dakota people. Now at Wounded Knee, there's a ravine, a small little valley where a river would run through. And many of the Dakota people ran into this ravine to seek shelter. Now, one of the things we don't talk about with Wounded Knee is that the US Congress awards 20 Congressional Medals of Honor to the US soldiers who participated in this massacre that killed 350 Dakota people in a single day. And three of those medals, the one for William Austin, the one for John Gresham, and the one for Albert McMillan, were given specifically for these soldiers who went into the ravine to flush the Dakota people out of the ravine so they could be shot down by the guns up above. In 1840, this is what our nation looked like. The lands to the east are established states. The lands to the west are territories or even uncharted lands. If you go online, you can look up the number of medals of honor our Congress awards. And you can look them up by war and by conflict. 
If you look up medals of honor for the Indian war campaigns, you will find that between 18, um, 1839 and 1898, the US, US Congress awards 425 medals of honor to US soldiers who participated in the Indian war campaigns. And at the end of the century, this is what our nation looked like. We had completed our manifest destiny all the way from the East Coast to the Pacific Ocean. During that period, the majority population ballooned from 5.3 million to 76.2 million. And the native population collapsed from 600,000 to 237,000. If you're doing your math, that's a 61.47% rate of genocide. If you're comparing your math, that's almost twice the rate of genocide that Nazi Germany had over the Jews in World War II. So we just have to be honest. Between 1839 and 1898, the US Congress awards 425 medals of honor for the genocide of American Indians and the ethnic cleansing of this continent. On December 19, 2009, Congress passes House Resolution 3326. This is the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. It's the 67 page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD. Page 45, subsection 8113 is titled Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is the seven bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. Basically says you had some nice lands. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now call it all of our lands and we'll steward it together. And then it ends with a disclaimer saying nothing in here is legally binding. To date, this apology has not been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. The problem is, is we don't teach a history of our country, we teach a mythology. The mythology is that we have a legacy of discovery, we believe in equality, we have a history of expansion, we're exceptional, liberty and justice here exist for everybody, and we're a Christian nation. Let me show you how deep this mythology runs. One of the presidents our nation considers to be its greatest is Abraham Lincoln. In fact, here in DC, he has the largest monument, the largest memorial of all of the other memorials. His is actually based on the architecture of a temple from Greece. Now, if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, you will find that at the base of the memorial, there's a small museum. It's about the size of a mid-sized classroom. On each wall, there are plaques with quotes, sayings, writings of Abraham Lincoln about different parts of his legacy. On one wall, when you walk in, there's these five plaques that have quotes about his legacy regarding the union. And in the middle of this wall is this quote. It says, I would save the union. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the union. It's not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. There's a quote hanging at the Lincoln Memorial that literally says, according to Abraham Lincoln, black lives don't matter. I don't know what's more offensive, the fact that he said it or that someone felt that that was appropriate to hang at this space. The 13th Amendment is a huge part of Abraham Lincoln's legacy. Remember, the 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It simply redefines and codifies slavery under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. In his inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln actually advocated for what was called the Corwin Amendment. The Corwin Amendment was an amendment that got passed by the Senate but never was ratified by the, con but by the state. But the Corwin Amendment constitutionally protected slavery in the states where it already existed. Abraham Lincoln was a blatant white supremacist. He stated it over and over in the Lincoln-Douglas debates and even in his inauguration addresses. 
and he was looking for a way to keep slavery constitutionally protected. He couldn't do it with the Corman Amendment, so he did it with the 13th Amendment we actually have, which kept it legal in prison. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act and the Pacific Railway Act. The Homestead Act allocated 160 acres to any U.S. family who went west and homesteaded for five years. And the Pacific Railway Act provided the land and the resources to complete the transcontinental railway that had reached Omaha, Nebraska, and was trying to get all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Within three years of signing these two bills, after the hanging of the Dakota 38 in Minnesota, after the long walk of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache in New Mexico, and after the Sand Creek Massacre, Abraham Lincoln had literally ethnically cleansed all of the native nations from the states of Minnesota, New Mexico, and Colorado, which was exactly along some of the primary routes of the Transcontinental Railway. The first, the primary route, which went from Omaha, Nebraska, through Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and came out near San Francisco. The, the northern route that started in Duluth, Minnesota, went through Minnesota, North Dakota, um, Montana, Idaho, and comes out near Seattle. And the southern route that went through the territory of New Mexico, Arizona, and comes out near Los Angeles. Within three years of signing those bills, Abraham Lincoln has literally ethnically cleansed the states of Minnesota, Colorado, and New Mexico of native nations, making him one of the most genocidal presidents in the history of our country. In the 1500s, the world population was 480 million. In 1900, it was 1.6 billion. That's a 3.39% rate of growth. Europe during that same period went from 82 million to 300 million for a 3.65 rate of growth. Africa, even with the horrors of the slave trade, grew from 63 million to 123 million for a 1.782 rate of growth. The USA went from zero Western European people to 76.2 million people. A conservative estimate of the population of the continental United States of indigenous peoples in the 1500s is 6 million. The lowest point was in, in, the, seven, in the 1870s, it went down to 237,000. That's a 0.0395% rate of growth, which is actually a rate of death or a genocide rate of 96.05%. The genocide that took place here on Turtle Island from discovery to the 19th century was one of the worst genocides in the history of the world. It was greater than Rwanda. It was greater than Nazi Germany. It was even greater than the 19th century. A 96.05% rate of genocide during those 400 years. In 1851, Peter Burnett, who was the first governor of California. California went, um, became a state and in his first day of the state address, this is what he said, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or the wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying famine's broken out and we can't feed these people. And he's not saying disease has struck and we can't stop it spread. He's literally saying, we cannot stop killing these people as we complete our manifest destiny. We don't teach a history of our country, we teach a mythology. The mythology says discovery, the history says dehumanization. The mythology says equality, the history says for a select few. The, the mythology says expansion, the history says ethnic cleansing, the mythology says exceptionalism, the history says genocide, the mythology says liberty and justice for all, the history says liberty and justice for white landowning men. The mythology says Christian nation, the history says we are the next uh, um, version of Christendom, Christian empire. So what do we do about this? What do we do with this history? Well, we have to find a way to address this at an 
foundational level, right? When President Obama stated in 2016 that we the people now means all the people, that's absolutely not true. Our foundations are still incredibly exclusive. We still have 51 gender specific male pronouns in our constitution. We still have a, a 13th Amendment that keeps slavery legal in prison. We still have the exclusion of natives and the exclusion of Africans throughout our constitution. We still have Supreme Court case precedents based on the dehumanization of people of color. We the people meaning all the people might sound beautiful, but it doesn't actually mean that in our founding documents. And we see this throughout our history, right? Whether it's with the lynching of George Floyd or the, 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 the breaking of treaties with native nations, we see that we the people in this country does not mean, does not include all the people. Joe Biden, likes to misquote the Declaration of Independence. He likes to say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Again, that sounds beautiful, but that's not what the document says. And we actually haven't fixed that yet. Earlier this year in 2020, the state of Virginia ratified the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. They ratified it, making they became the 38th state to ratify it. But because the, the time to ratify it had expired, a self-imposed deadline put on it by Congress, it actually did not become an amendment. So think about that. In the year 2020, we still not have decided to constitutionally protect the rights of women and 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 create that and protect that within our constitution, we can't even decide to do that in 2020. So it's nice to be able to quote and say, well, we hold these truths to be seven that all men and women are created equal, but that's not what our document says and that's not what is actually in place right now. If we want to become a nation where we the people means all the people, if we want to become a nation where all men and all women are considered created equal, we have to address our foundations. On my website at wirelesshogan.com, I, I, I have a blog. About five years ago, I decided to read through the constitution. I had never read through it as an adult. I did it one time when I was in school, I think. I'd never done it as an adult. I read through preamble all the way through the 27th amendment. It was then that I learned, and the further I read, the more appalled I became at how exclusive this document was. Throughout my campaign, I would challenge people. I said, if you think the Constitution was written to include everybody, get on a Zoom call with Native peoples, African American people, women, anyone from LGBTQIA, 2S+, and read the Constitution out loud you won't read very long before you begin to blush and get embarrassed at how absolutely exclusive this document is. In fact, I was so offended when I was reading it about five years ago, I downloaded it to my computer and I said, we have to correct this. And so I went through the constitution with a strike through font and every place that I found a gender specific male pronoun, article two, section one, I highlighted them and I put a strike through font through the word and replaced it with a gender neutral or a proper noun. 13th amendment, or this, this is the 15th amendment. Again, his, he, his, he, let's correct that. 13th amendment, let's just put a strike through font through that clause. Let's not keep slavery legal in prison. Let's in abolish it fully and completely, period. End of story. 14th Amendment. Let's take away all the exclusive language from these amendments. And I added one, one amendment, one addition of words. See, again, the challenge our nation has is that we have nothing in our constitution that states we have a comprehensive value for life, a corporate value for life at any level, the environment, other people, the world around us. 
So I decided, what if we added two words, just two simple words into our preamble? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, value life. It doesn't define what life is. It doesn't say how we have to value it. All it states is that as a nation, we have a corporate value for life. Yes, this will make passing laws much more complicated. Yes, it will, it will make um, um, coming to a consensus on things much more difficult. But the moment there's nothing in our, in our founding documents that state we have a value for life. And actually the whole implicit bias of our constitution and our other founding documents is that the, the lives of white people are valued at a higher level than everybody else. So that is my proposal to fix some of the, of the problems with our foundations. But we have another problem. This one's actually, I would say, a much deeper problem. And that's land titles, right? Going back to 1823, land titles are based on discovery and this document that states that white landowning men are superior and native peoples and people of color are savages and we're not fully human. Even as recently as 2005, Ruth Bader Ginsburg references the doctrine of discovery, essentially calls native savages and says that native nations cannot reestablish sovereignty over their traditional lands, even if they buy them on the open market. We have to figure out what to do with land titles. Earlier this year, in, in spring, in the early spring, late winter of, two, of 2020, the Mashpee Wampanoag, who have reservation lands on the East Coast, in the, in, in the second term of uh, the Obama administration, President Obama established a reservation for the Mashpee Wampanoag. I think it was in Massachusetts. And they, they took land and they put it into trust, which means the land is held by the federal government and they allowed the Mashpee Wampanoag to establish that as their reservation and the lands were held in trust by the US government. Now, you may not know this, but all reservations, not all, most reservations are not owned by the tribes. They are lands held in trust for us by the federal government. So in other words, we don't have the rights to them. We're tenants on those lands the tribe or the, the government holds the title to those lands. They just hold them in trust for us. This again, goes back to the doctrine of discovery and how discovery and land titles are based in the first place. But so the Obama administration in, 2000, in like 2015, 2014, took some land into trust for the Mashpee Wampanoag and established the reservation. And in 2020, it was March and April of 2020, the Trump administration disestablished those, that same reservation land for the Mashpee Wampanoag, kicked them off their reservation. This is like, and this is during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? This is like um, kicking someone out of their house or evicting them from, from their, their rental apartment during, while there's a hurricane going on in the same city, right? It's just one of the most worst times, unjust times to do this. Not only was it unjust to do it, but to do it during a pandemic was, was unthinkable. And there was a large outcry from politicians, from people, from the Mashpee Wampanoag, how unjust the Trump administration was doing in disestablishing this reservation. Joe Biden, our current president, our, our president-elect, I'm sorry, he actually released a statement on it. I, I spoke about this. A lot of other candidates spoke about it. Joe Biden spoke about it. And in his remarks, he mentioned how he and President Obama had established this reservation. He mentioned how unjust it was that the Trump administration disestablished those reservation lands. And, and he said that he would not do that. He then went on in his statement, and this is what he said. He said, one of the most important roles the federal government plays in rebuilding the nation to nation relationship is taking land into trust on behalf of tribes. It is critical, he said, for tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Now that sounds okay, because we're used to hearing this about native nations. But imagine if he said this to another country, 
Imagine if Joe Biden wrote one of the most important roles of the U.S. government plays in rebuilding the nation to nation relationship with France is by taking land into trust on behalf of France. France. This is critical for French sovereignty and self-determination. He would never say that, right? It's laughable at best and a declaration of war at worst, right? You would never say that. But he said it to native nations, why? Because of the doctrine of discovery. Because of the belief that natives do not have title to their land and the federal government has to hold it for them. So all he's promising to do is to be a better landlord than Donald Trump was. That's all he's promising to do. He's not saying the native nations have sovereignty over these lands. He's not saying you have title to these lands. He's not saying that because we have a nation to nation treaty with you, you have rights over these lands. All he's saying is that he will be a better landlord than Donald Trump is. Now, this is very important because this whole idea of putting lands into trust. This year, in fact, just this past summer, it was in July or August of 2020, the Supreme Court ruled on a very important case for Indian country. It's McGirt versus Oklahoma. According to federal law, if a native person is, convict, is, is accused of a crime against another native person on a reservation, that trial must be held in federal court. So McGirt committed a crime in Tulsa, Oklahoma against another native person. It was a horrendous crime and he was tried in state court and convicted. And he appealed, not saying he was innocent, but saying he needs to be tried in federal court because he's native. And he argued that because of the treaties, Tulsa is still reservation land. Oklahoma defended itself and said, we've never used, treated this land as reservation land. And so they said, so we had a right to try you in state court. That case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And Indian country was paying very close attention to the state because basically this state, this case was arguing, McGirt was arguing in the Creek Nation, whose land reservation was in Tulsa, were joined the lawsuit as well because this was gonna determine was the whole Eastern half of Oklahoma a reservation or was it state land? So the lower courts had ruled in favor of Oklahoma and McGirt and the Creek Nation appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court reversed the decision of the lower courts. In other words, they ruled in favor of McGirt and the Creek Nation. They stated that the state of Oklahoma does not have the right to disestablish reservation lands. They stated the courts do not have rights to disestablish reservation lands. Many people saw this case, this ruling, as a huge win for Indian country. And it was in a sense, because it basically said that the eastern half of Oklahoma was still reservation land. However, because I don't trust the Supreme Court, I actually read the opinion the morning it came out and I was appalled. There were probably 10 places, seven to eight places throughout the ruling where what I'm gonna to read to you was stated in another way, but it was littered, constantly stated and restated throughout the entire ruling. They said that to determine whether a tribe continues to hold a reservation, there is only one place we may look, the acts of Congress. This court long ago held that the legislature wields significant constitutional authority when it comes to tribal relations, possessing even the authority to breach its own promises and treaties. What the United States Supreme Court is stating is that any time the US government desires, the Congress wants to, they can disestablish reservation lands and they can break treaties with native nations and no one will hold them accountable. Now, all of Indian country knows that the federal government breaks treaties with us all the time. This is the first time I actually saw a, a, a ruling by the Supreme Court that literally stated the federal government has the right to break treaties and there is no way to hold them accountable even though the constitution says treaties are the supreme law of the land, but the Supreme Court here is ruling that no, 
Congress can break treaties whenever it wants. It, there's no one who's gonna hold them accountable to keeping treaties with native nations. And so this is the challenge that we face as a country. What do we do with land titles? We the people will never mean all the people unless we do something about land titles. If you, they, it was announced earlier that I was a candidate for president in 2020. And many of you probably never even heard of my campaign. One of the reasons you've never heard of my campaign is first I ran as an independent, which doesn't get much media coverage in the first place. But second, both the media and the other parties, the Democrats and the Republican parties literally ignored my campaign completely. They would literally write me out of stories, national stories of events I attended alongside other presidential candidates, and they would write me out of the story. The press and the, pol and the political parties had no desire to talk about the things I was talking about. Why? Because I was discussing the fact that we have to address land titles and nobody wants to deal with land titles. That's, that, that's a mess. No one knows what to do. It would put all the land titles of our capitalistic nation on the table and no one wants to deal with that. So how do we fix this? How do we address this problem? Well, one of my proposals is that the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that took place in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. However, I wouldn't call ours truth and reconciliation because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, right? And if you look at our history, that harmony never existed. Race is a social construct. And the United States of America, America constructed race, the black race and the American Indian race, it constructed race for the purpose of oppressing and dividing. Racial reconciliation is a misnomer. It's not an accurate word. There was no harmony previously. So we don't need a truth and reconciliation commission. We need a truth and conciliation commission, not only to deal with land titles, but to deal with this incredible ethnic cleansing, genocidal and enslaving history that our nation has with people of color throughout its entire existence. And I think we need that sooner rather than later. In fact, my goal, one of the reasons I ran for president was to have this truth and, rec and conciliation commission even in the next decade. I was hoping for 2021. There's a native elder, his name is George Erasmus. He's from the Diné people up in Canada. And when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission up in Canada, he used this quote. He said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where communities to be formed, he said, common memory must be created. I love this quote, I think it's genius because it gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, right? We don't have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers a mythological history of discovery and expansion of opportunity and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color that have the lived experience of stolen lands and broken treaties, of enslavement and Jim Crow laws of boarding schools and Indian massacres, of internment camps and segregation, mass incarceration, families being ripped apart at our borders, and there's no common memory. And there's actually no point in our history where you can look back and say we had healthy community across racial lines. That point doesn't exist. Our nation is in desperate need of creating this common memory. Our nation is in desperate need of a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. Our nation is in desperate need of dealing with our past, of addressing our foundations, so that we can, for the very first time, build a nation that our founding fathers never even imagined. Build a nation that Abraham Lincoln didn't even have the courage to think about build a nation that our country has not achieved even yet in 2020, which is a nation where for the very first time, we the people actually might mean all the people. 
this is my vision. This is my goal. This is what I want to see happen in our country. And we have to deal with it at a very foundational level. My relatives, thank you for letting me talk with you today. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my, my passion, my vision with you. I'd love to take some time to do some Q&A if, if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Thank you, Mark. So if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Or if you feel comfortable verbally asking your question, then feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a question for you. Um, so I noticed that your presentation, you pointed out the many things wrong. Well, that shouldn't be in our constitution. Um, so I noticed that you said, you know, what you went and you highlighted through all the things that you would change just wondering your opinion, would it be better to all to just do away with altogether the constitution and redo it? Cause I feel like when I hear things about this, I feel like I, I kind of still wouldn't be satisfied building on a rotten base. And it's kind of like we built America on this constitution that was rotten and racist and anti-black and anti anything that wasn't a white landowning male. Yeah. So what I did, and actually one of the proposals of my campaign was this, my, my first 100 day plan for my first 100 days in office was to remove the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy from our constitution. I wasn't addressing balance of powers. I wasn't changing checks and balances. I was simply trying to remove the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy. See, one of the things that I, one of the goals I was trying to do was I wanted to do something that I thought was achievable, but address it at a foundational level so we could actually have systemic change, right? The problem right now is, so if you, if you paid attention, and I'm, I'm sure you, all, you, you were paying attention because there's a lot of engagement with this, over the, the past six months, right? Beginning with, well, not beginning, but the lynching of George Floyd, the, the other shootings, the, the Jacob Blake shooting and all the other racial injustices that have happened in the past year of our nation, right? We had a very robust debate on systemic racism and institutionalized white supremacy. After the lynching of George Floyd, President Trump suggested that, and actually he actually issued an executive order banning certain chokeholds. Joe Biden, he went on record and said, we should just retrain officers to shoot people in the kneecaps instead of in the chest. That was his solution. Neither one of those proposals were gonna fix the problem, right? If those would have fixed the problem, then what happened to Jacob Blake should have been fine because he was neither choked nor was he shot lethally. But what happened to Jacob Blake was absolutely unjust. And so the way we have to fix these is address it at a foundational level. We had a debate on defunding the police. My proposal is we have to abolish slavery. Right now it's our criminal justice system where we've, we've constitutionally protected white supremacy there. And so one of the reasons I made, I'm suggesting the changes I'm suggesting, which is to edit the constitution, not to amend it, to edit it. I, it's good that we can amend our constitution, but the problem is, is you have to still read through this very racist, sexist and white supremacist document and get to the end and say, oh, he actually should have meant they, or, or, or his should have meant theirs. By editing it, we can actually address it in the, in the place. And rather than having like, so we can address it one of two ways, right? We can say, well, women are equal and LGBTQIA2 plus are equal and black people are equal and native people are equal. And we can just address it that way. But most of our constitution, it elevates white people. It, it lifts up white landowning men. I just tweeted this afternoon, I found one of, I, I said one of the best ways to confront racism and to deconstruct white supremacy 
is not to beg white people and white institutions to acknowledge my humanity, but to be blunt and insistent with white people that they are not superior. You are not higher than me. I'm not gonna argue my humanity with you. I'm gonna diminish your deity, which is the problem. White people have put themselves way up above everybody else. So when, when we look at this, we have, we have white landowning men up here, we have everyone else down here, right? We think the goal is to be up here. That's not true. Up here is dependent upon the oppression of the people down here. Life up here is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. The only way you can live at this level is if you oppress and exploit the people beneath you. So yes, we have to lift up the people from the bottom, but we have to massively lower the people at the top so that we can all see one another as peers. This is what, one of the things I, I say all the time. I, I, don't, I don't use the term white privilege. White privilege makes it sound like what white people have is a blessing and they just need to learn how to share. That's not true. Again, up here is not sustainable. You can't live this way in a global community. It has to come down. I call it what it is, it's white supremacy and we have to confront it. It's a racial injustice. We have to confront it. And so, and so what I'm trying to do with the edits I'm putting into the constitution is I'm not trying to think of every little group that we need to now argue for their humanity of. I'm trying to take out the wording that actually elevates white landowning men over and above everybody else. So that we actually can now argue that this literally was meant, is meant to apply to everybody. And I think those types of changes are reachable. Again, most people think the, the constitution is an inclusive document. When they read it, they get shocked. And so my, my, I, I would tell people, yeah, I'm actually just trying to edit the document so it actually says what you think it says, right? It, most people think the document is meant to include everybody and they're, sh they're shocked when they learn it, it doesn't. And so I'm saying, yeah, we're just making the changes so it actually says what you think it says. And I think that level of change is doable. Now, that doesn't mean that the document's ready yet. It's not perfect yet, right? It's not perfect. It's not finished yet. There are other places we absolutely need to address. One of the things I talked about um, in, during over the past few years and in my campaign was the Second Amendment. If you read the Second Amendment, that amendment is absolutely dripping in implicit racial bias and in white supremacy. And we need, I'm arguing, I would argue we, just, we have to throw out the whole amendment. I didn't include that in my 100 day plan because that's making a major change to the constitution, which I'm ready to argue for it. And I think we can win that debate, but it's not gonna, it's not, basically making the constitution say something people thinks it already says is entering into the midst of a huge debate and so i'm ready to go into that debate but that's going to be a separate step so i would i would tackle that after but yeah the the things i propose and that are on my website at wirelesshogan.com and um i have that draft of the constitution up there that you can go and look at and you can see the the changes i'm proposing and I think they're doable. I think we can we can make the case and actually do it fairly quickly. I appreciate your question. Thanks for asking that. Thank you, Nani, for that question. And thank you, Mark, for your response. We did receive two more questions in the chat. So we received three more questions in the chat. Um, but before I went on to the next question, I just wanted to put in a quick survey for the event. Um, if anyone has to leave shortly or anything, if you could please just be sure to fill out the survey. And the next question that we received is, what do you make about the potential for Deb Hallis Laguna Pueblo to be appointed as Secretary of the Interior that has an impact on natural resources, Indian education and affairs? 
Yeah, I actually would fully support that. I really like Deb Holland. Um, I I think that it would be great for her to be um, in that position. I think she's qualified for it. I'm not holding my breath to see that happen. Um, because of the divided Congress that we have and the split in power between the White House and the Senate that we're most likely going to have, I th and, and the fact that Joe Biden has pretty much stated he's going to maintain the status quo um, and he's not going to go too far to the left on anything. Um, I, I'm not holding my breath for that appointment, but if it came about, I would absolutely support it. One of the things that I think we need in our in our um, government and actually one of my proposals when I was running is so on one hand the Department of the Interior that's kind of where if if natives are going to be put into the cabinet like right that's where that's where they would put us because that's kind of the stereotype right just like Ben Carson was put in charge of HUD right I mean that's the stereotype um, and so I would I actually said when I was running I would love to appoint a Native American Secretary of State. I would love to have someone indigenous to these lands be our primary ambassador to the nations. And one of the conversations I would love to address, right? So we've had a massive debate over the past few years about our systemic racism and sexism and white supremacy within our domestic policies. We're all aware they exist. Well, when you look at our closest allies, NATO nations, the UK, France, Germany, the Netherlands, right? All of these countries are former colonial nations that at one point colonized much of the world, right? And most of them have not, they're, they're not actively colonizing lands, but they still have colonies, some of them. And I think one of the challenges we, we have is that we have at least exposed some of our racism, sexism, and white supremacy in our domestic policies. We've never addressed it in our foreign policy. And not just in how badly we treat nations, but I would argue that I think a lot of our, a lot of our um, values that we share with our NATO allies are actually colonial values. And so we have to reevaluate those relationships. And I think having not only um, having a Native American Secretary of State as the primary ambassador of our nation to the world would be a tremendous step towards addressing some of those conversations, not only with the people where we have challenging relations with, but some of our closest allies, where I think we need to have those conversations. Thank you. And we actually do have one more question. And that question is, is there anything that we on an individual level can do in order to address and seek to improve the situation of oppression of Native peoples? One of the things I encourage people to do is um, A, to be much more aware of the history, but B, to be aware of whose land you're living on. There's a great website that I use. It's native-land.ca. Um, and it allows you to put in a city, a zip code, an address of anywhere in the country. And it will tell you what native nations are indigenous to those lands, what treaties were signed there, what languages were spoken there. It's not the final authority on all these things, but it's a great place to begin your research. And I, what I encourage people to do most is to, um, is to learn whose land are you living on? And then to begin to learn the history of the people from that land. And if they are still here, and many nations still are, to actually begin to build relationships with those nations and with the people from those tribes. And so by doing that, like, you know, one of the things people say to me all the time is, well, I, I don't know this because you know, there's no natives in my context. And that's actually one of the problems with how race was constructed, right? So the way our country constructed race 
and the two primary races it constructed was the black race and the American Indian race. The black race was constructed in part through what's called the one drop rule. The one drop rule stated if you have a single drop of African blood, you're black. Why do we have this rule? Well, because black people were enslaved. They were the labor force. The nation wanted as many black people as possible, so they constructed the race to multiply it. The one drop rule allowed a white slave owner to rape his female enslaved people and produce more people to enslave. That's how it worked. The American Indian race was constructed in part through what's called the blood quantum rule. The blood quantum rule states if you marry outside your tribe, you're maybe full, but then you're half, then you're eighth, then a 16th. Eventually you're bred out of existence. Why? Well, because the mythology is this land was empty. There was no one here. The country has treaty obligations to native people. So they wanted to diminish our numbers. So they constructed our race to breed us out of existence. And so people say, well, I don't know this history because there's no natives in my context. That was by design. The nation wanted to construct itself in a way so you would never have to think about the people who are ethnically cleansed from the lands where you're now living. Because that's a very uncomfortable thought. And so, and so I encourage people to start your journey by learning about the people whose land you're living on. And then as a part of that journey, to actually begin to build relationship. And the only way you're gonna do that, that's not gonna happen by and large by chance. You're gonna to have to intentionally go out of your way to seek out these relationships. And so I, I encourage that this is one of the best ways to begin that process of addressing this history is to basically allow, allow yourself to acknowledge that we are still here right, that native peoples are still here and the genocide wasn't completed. And then to begin, build relation, begin building relationships with that. Thank you. And does anyone else have any final questions that they would like to ask Mark this evening? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Um, and we hope that everyone is motivated to continue educating themselves and learning um, and supporting Native American peoples. Thank you. And I, I would encourage you, I have a lot of resources online. So there's a lot of places. If you just Google my name, Mark Charles, or if you Google Mark Charles Navajo, I actually put Navajo on almost all of my tags of everything. So you'll get a ton of resources. Videos I produce, I put out about these things, articles I've written, um, YouTube live streams that I do. Of course, I've written my, this book, On Selling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, which is a great resource. It contains even more in-depth history of what I was talking about today. Um, and uh, yeah, so I welcome you. You can follow me on social media. I'm Wireless Hogan on almost every social media. Um, so that's my Twitter, that's my Instagram, that's my YouTube. Uh, it's even my, I think I have a TikTok. I, I had one for the campaign. I think I have a personal one too. I haven't started using it yet though. But yeah, so I'm online, um, also on Facebook and, and there too. So you're welcome to follow me. I'm continuing to engage these issues and to push these things forward as best I can. And uh, it was an honor to be with you today. And I thank you for the invitation to join you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Hakonet, take care. <laughs>